started. One, my John Hardigan. I am the director of the Behavioral Health Education Initiative here in the Bureau of Community Support Services in the AIDS Institute. And we're very happy to host this WebEx initially for the Behavioral Health Education Initiative providers, but because of content, we have opened it up to other providers uh, within our, our Bureau initiatives. So we have some folks from our Nutrition Initiative, our community, um, our ESS, and health education initiative and our emerging communities contracts. So we're excited to have quite a large audience um, participating today in this webinar. So with further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Sharon Stancliffe, who is the medical director of the Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, she's a family physician with a certification in addiction medicine. Um, Dr. Club serves as a consultant for the AIDS Institute um, and the Office of U Drug Use Health, which she'll be talking about a little bit later during the presentation. She's been working uh, with us for a, a long time, over a decade, and we're very happy to have her today to talk with us about uh, the heroin epidemic and, and um, different treatment options, and methadone and buprenorphine. So I'm going to introduce Sharon and uh, let her begin. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you much. I'm really glad to be talking with you, all of you about this today, and I hope that you'll bring some questions and thoughts and suggestions um, at the end and some clarification questions as we go along, though, if you need that. So um, I'm going to give a little overview of what the problem is. I think probably most of you are aware of that. Um, I will focus a lot of the, th the talk on methadone and on buprenorphine, and then I'll end by talking about some of the drug user health initiatives that are really exciting coming out of the AIDS Institute right now. So I think as probably many of you are aware, we truly have a emergency, a public health emergency about opioid overdose deaths. Um, I have the data here in front of you from 2000 up through 2014, and you can see that we have had a huge number of deaths from prescription opioids. We hoped back in like 2012, 2013 it was flattening out, but it unfortunately continues to rise. Um, in conjunction with that, we've seen a huge uptick in the deaths related to heroin. So unfortunately, things are really not yet getting better and have a lot of work to do. Um, here's New York State data, and you can also see that, that um, we continue to have a rise in deaths. Now, do be aware that, that we know we have under reporting, especially in some of the more rural areas. Um, it, it's hard to get great data from many, many places. Um, we also know that the deaths are continuing to rise, as I will show you in a couple of minutes. Um, I, I imagine most of you are hearing a little bit about fentanyl. So fentanyl is a pain medicine that is completely synthetic. It can be 50 to 100 or even greater, more powerful than morphine. That's, uh, morphine is essentially our standard of how we compare things. Currently, there is a lot of illicitly manufactured fentanyl being made primarily in China and Mexico, but there may well be fentanyl labs within our country as well. I've heard of that in New York. And the, this, this white powder can be mixed with heroin, can be sold as heroin, and unfortunately, sometimes we're even seeing deaths that we believe that people had only meant to be taking cocaine and not opioids. Somehow there seems to be some fentanyl mixed in there too, and we've seen pills looking like Xanax and other benzodiazepines that are actually made from fentanyl. Um, it's even more unpredictable than heroin because it's so potent, and we're seeing an in, it increasingly responsible for many overdose deaths. Now, I did these slides about two weeks ago, and I'm already finding that they're out of date. Um, so this is data from Buffalo, um, and it looks at the opioid-related overdose deaths in 2014 and in 2015, partway through 2015. Um, in 2014, there were 127 overdose fatalities, and as you can see from the, part of the pie chart, the 22 percent were fentanyl related and another 14, another 9 percent were a mix of fentanyl and heroin. Um, 
this is changing rapidly, and I, I don't have official data from 2016, but I can tell you about that. When we go over to 2015, you can see a dramatically higher number of overdose deaths. And if you look at the pie chart, you'll see that 43% were fentanyl-related, and another 19% contained both heroin and fentanyl. Um, 2016 data, unfortunately, what I last saw from July is going to have more deaths in the Erie County area than in 2015. That's true in many counties, but a couple of the counties are extremely good at looking at their data in an up-to-date time. Um, everybody's trying. Um, now, this is the slide that's a little bit out of date. This is New York City that separates out all opioids on the top, and then it looks at heroin, which is continuing to rise and has continued to rise through 2016. Um, you can see that in New York City, opioid analgesics are not such a big contributor as they are across New York State. And then you can see that fentanyl used to not be a player. At the end of 2015, it was up to about 15% of the deaths, and data that they released, I think, two weeks ago found that fentanyl is involved in almost 50% of the deaths. So this is a problem across the state at this point. And I, I also should add that New York State, despite how bad our problem is, is really lagging behind many, many other states around the country. Some of the things that we're doing are helping. We do not have as high a death rate as many states, such as Kentucky, Massachusetts, across the country, some of the things that we're doing that we'll talk about today may be helping us. Um, so there's another part to this problem. Um, we all work for the AIDS Institute, and we know that drug use and HIV are not so, well, we have very few cases of HIV transmitted through injection drug use at this point. Syringe access, which we'll talk about later, um, treatment, many things have really helped that. Unfortunately, it's harder to prevent hepatitis C transmission through injection drug use, probably because there's a lot more virus per droplet of blood and it'd be hardier as well. So it used to be that we saw hepatitis C primarily among the baby boomers, so the, the age cohort was getting older. We have regulations requiring that everybody in the baby boomer um, generation be on a test for hepatitis C at least once, but it's changed really dramatically. So on this chart, you can see sort of two bumps. Um, the one on the further right is the baby boomer set, an aging cohort that hoped that would be where hepatitis C was going. On the left side, that earlier bump, look at that. It's got new hepatitis C among young people. We are seeing this across the country. Um, so we now have younger people that are injecting that don't have enough access to not only syringes and needles, but to the other equipment needed to be safe, safer if one is injecting. So seeing that women are likely to get hepatitis C as men are, and that's a change as well. I imagine that all of you are seeing this in your work. Um, I, th I think most of you have heard about the outbreak of hepatitis C, I mean, excuse me, of HIV in Indiana in 2015. This was really, really dramatic. It's a small county, Austin County or Austin Town, I'm sorry, I forget which. Um, Scott County, Austin is the name of the town. Um, it's a very small town and it's a very poor town. Many people living there have actually no access to running water. Um, through sharing needles, they were injecting a particular opioid analgesic. They had oh, nearly 200 cases of HIV related to injection drug use. It was one very families and doctor that diagnosed a case and then they did contact tracing, this is what happened. Now, we've had syringe access for a very long time. Indiana now finally has a little bit of needle exchange, but this could happen anywhere. Um, we really need to make sure that we're getting the education out to this newer generation of people injecting drugs. We need to get them the information and access to needles and hopefully access to good drug treatment as quickly as we can. Um, so I'm going to focus on drug treatment, um, but I want to make it clear that the people who use drugs need 
a lot of things besides just drug treatment. Not everybody is ready for drug treatment at a given moment, even if we think that maybe they should, but there's other services that they need. Um, I think I'll start with harm reduction services. We'll talk about syringe access and we'll talk about naloxone so that people don't die of an evolving overdose. Um, counseling and support. So we need a place for people to go that are not ready to completely give up drugs. They may be ready to give up some drugs, but there needs to be a space for them out there. They also need primary care. It's very clear that people that are using drugs, people that are injecting drugs, can actually take care of some of their health needs, assuming that they've got um, primary care providers, OBGYN, psychiatrists that are willing to work with them even if they continue to use drugs. And as we'll see with buprenorphine, you don't need to be in a drug treatment program to begin to deal with stopping or reducing the use of illicit opioids. So that's something that we really work, need to work on expanding. Um, and we have traditional drug treatment. OASAS runs many, many programs across the state, um, inpatient, outpatient, and that is an extremely important part of the spectrum. And I will talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so just look at the treatment. Um, the first thing people usually think about is medically assisted withdrawal, um, which can be from opioids or from alcohol or benzodiazepines, where we give people medications to slowly taper them off, whatever one of those drugs might be. Many people don't actually call that treatment. Um, as we will probably see, it, it is the first step for many people into treatment, um, but also when we're talking about opioids, drug treatment, if it's not followed, I mean, drug detoxification, if it's not followed up by other services, increases people's risk of overdose and death. I'll come back to that a little later. Um, so that's, that's one step and one piece of the puzzle. Um, most drug treatment has a psychosocial component to it, and they tend to be fairly similar across the different drugs. With, with, there are some differences, but a lot of that is supportive counseling, trying to understand how to solve life problems without the use of drugs, often trying to understand some trauma in the background that may help people cease or reduce the, the risk of, of drug use. And this can be on outpatient basis with a once a week visit. It can be outpatient basis with all day spent in a drug treatment program. And we also have residential rehabilitation. Um, New York State OASAS runs 12 28 day detoxes themselves and licenses many, many others across the state. And finally, we have medical treatment, which may be delivered in drug treatment programs or may be delivered in primary care or even obstetric care. Um, it, it is a lot of options that we need to explore. I'm going to be focusing on opioid maintenance, speak about methadone and buprenorphine, but there is also a, a medication out there called naltrexone. Its, it's um, trade name is Vivitrol, which is a long-acting opioid blocker that is injected once a month. Um, this will probably turn out to be a good treatment for some portion of the people in need of treatment, but I, I'm going to leave it there unless we have questions at the end. We actually don't have good data saying that it reduces the overdose deaths, reduces the risk of HIV or hepatitis C. We do have that for opioid maintenance, so that's why I'll be concentrating on opioid maintenance. So why do we need maintenance? Um, why can't people just go into detox and stop and run with life? Well, we know that anyone who takes opioids on a regular basis will develop tolerance, meaning and tendons. So if you have a, a, a severe accident and you're in pain afterwards and you're taking opioids every day for a week, two weeks, a month, everybody will become dependent on them. Um, and they will go through some withdrawal when they stop and will need to taper off. Tolerance is another factor here where you one needs more and more of an opioid to get the same effect. It does happen very rapidly with pain, but if one is taking opioids to achieve getting high euphoria, um, that tolerance develops over time. So the person who began by spending $10 a day on heroin to get high ends up by spending 50 or 100 a day just to keep themselves out of withdrawal. Um, so that's, that's an important factor in why people go back and why people overdose. So everybody, you know, most people, you have your 
accident, you get better, you're all well, you taper off opioids, and you're fine. Some subset, whether it's because they were experimenting with heroin when they were 13 or had an accident when they were 33, and they're taking opioid analgesics, they don't feel okay when they stop, even if they taper off. They go back to using. They relapse. Some of those people will be able to move on with that medication treatment, but for those people that have had repeated relapses, and I'm not saying everybody needs to have repeated relapses before they get medication, but it's pretty clear that when people have had repeated relapses, the likelihood of continuing to relapse is extremely high and extremely dangerous, and those folks really need to be thinking about buprenorphine and methadone, and we need to be figuring out how to make that more accessible. Um, What's that about? Well, we, we, sometimes we call it craving. There's also this, this term, practiced abstinence syndrome, that some people just don't feel right after they stop taking opioids. There are some who theorize that they didn't feel right until they started taking opioids. Um, we do know that opioids have pretty strong antidepressant and anti-anxiety qualities for some people. Um, but what we find is that 80 90% of those with a severe opioid use disorder relapse after detox. And do aware that we're looking at a pretty select population. These are people that have essentially identified themselves as having a drug, drug um, problem. They've gone into treatment, and as we'll see, people think, well, I'm feeling better now. I'm going to leave treatment, but it, they can't. And I don't really think I can stop taking my blood pressure medicine unless I make major life changes, perhaps. So I'll keep taking it. But people always want to stop their medicine, whether they are, have diabetes or high blood pressure, depression. It's almost human to think, well, I'm better now. I'm going to stop. So people really need support in realizing that that may be the way that they can live a longer and happier and healthier life. Um, so we've known for many years, you can see that the reference I chose there is 1997, really, we've known it for longer. Um, opioid maintenance is the most effective treatment for heroin, well, I should be saying opioid use disorder. Here I've got my old slide, heroin addiction. Um, it can be and probably mostly should be combined with some psychosocial treatment. But again, we want to compare this to the treatment of diabetes with insulin. Um, we don't ask diabetes when they're going to get off of their insulin. We don't ask people wearing glasses when they're going to stop wearing their glasses. Um, if people want to stop and they can be supported and can do so, that's great, but they need to be also supported to continue as needed. Um, so. I want to just think about what are the goals of drug treatment in general, opioid maintenance. We want people to die. So a primary thing is to reduce people dying of, of drug-related problems, overdoses, HIV, hepatitis C, other kinds of infections. The heart can be infected from injecting and die, kill people that way. We want to reduce the transmission of blood viruses we're primarily talking about. HIV and hepatitis C, who knows what comes down the road, and we want them to do better. We want them to have good health and well-being. And then I moved to reduce heroin and other drug use lower on the list. That is, in many ways, the means to the end. Reduce stopping opioids, reduces mortality, reduces transmission of bloodborne viruses, increases health, but it's the means to the end, and I don't really see it as the end itself. And finally, we want to reduce the risk to the community, drug-related crime being a primary one. So what does methadone or buprenorphine do? Um, once you're on it, people go into drug withdrawal. We'll see that with buprenorphine, you have to be a little bit in withdrawal to get it started. Um, proper doses of methadone or buprenorphine will actually block the effects of heroin or the other opioids if taken. Um, it's, it's hard to sort of overcome the tolerance at that point. And the key thing is to prevent the powerful craving that we've talked about that people can feel long, long times after they've had detoxification. So those are, that's what we're really looking for. So methadone was first established in 1966 and was approved by the FDA in 1972. It was actually developed by a psychiatrist and a person studying metabolic disorders who looked at and users in East Harlem and other places around the country and said, this 
doesn't look like a moral failing. It's like a metabolic pro, um, problem. So they hospitalized people and they gave them different opioids. And when they started people on methadone with long acting, people said, I'm bored, I want to go back, I mean, you get me some paints, I want to become an artist again, or I need to go back to work. So that's kind of where again, and they always thought it would be long term. So methadone is an oral opioid agonist. It, it turns on those receptors, it's given once a day. It is very effective in reducing heroin use and the associated deep, um, risk behaviors. And it has been the gold standard of opioid use disorders treatment for many years. However, it is very stigmatized. Um, we culture where we think that people should be able to be drug-free, and that turns into medication-free. So that's a problem. It's also available only in methadone clinics with a few exceptions. Now, one of the exceptions is one can prescribe methadone for pain, and that's where we see methadone overdoses associated with, that we see overdoses associated with methadone use. But in order to treat addiction, it's only available in methadone clinics. Um, where I'm talking to people from across the state. Many of you come from cities where there are long waiting lists to get on methadone, and probably some of you are from Areas where the nearest methadone clinic might be a two-hour drive away, even if there were a slot. Um, once you enroll in methadone, you're required to go six or maybe seven days a week until you establish yourself as a as a patient that's acting appropriately. At which point, one can earn the privilege of coming five days a week, and eventually, there are people in the state that can go. To month because they, they have shown themselves to be free of drugs on urine toxicology. They have attended sufficient amounts of counseling. But now, as I say, in New York's upstate, the clinics are full. In New York City, we've got slots. People often don't want to enter methadone because of these restrictions and the stigma. Enter buprenorphine, which is commonly known as Suboxone. That's, that's the first trade name that it came out under. We now have several, and it's generic. Um, this was FDA approved in 2002, and it was really we have these two drugs now, methadone and buprenorphine, that we can maintain people on with opioids. It's illegal to maintain them on any other opioid. Um, and then we have the naltrexone I mentioned. So it's a little bit unusual in its restrictions. Physicians need to take an eight-hour course and apply for a waiver from the Drug Enforcement Administration in order to prescribe the, the medication. However, once they're waivered, they can have the patient come every day, or they can have the patient come once a month, or they can do refills. So it's very different than methadone that way. Um, it's a sublingual medication that can be taken. Most people take it once or twice a day, but in some places, people have found that they can take it every other day, which is really only useful if you're doing supervised dosing. We've only had since 2002, but it appears that it's equal in results to methadone for most people. One is not better than the other. We need both on hand because some people do better with one and others without the other. So these regulations are strict. You have to be a qualified physician, as I said, or be boarded in addiction medicine. There are several boards in that. One thing extremely exciting is a law that passed last summer will allow physician assistants and nurse practitioners to prescribe sometime within the next year. Um, I'm going to come back to some of the myths, but you are required to have access to appropriate psychosocial services. Not to necessarily to have your patients go to them, though, um, and we'll come back to that. And it's also really kind of strange that the first year you're limited to 30 patients only, and then you apply for a waiver to increase to 100 patients. And now, under that same law, the CARA Act, um, some physicians in some settings will be allowed to have as many as 275 patients. So allowing PAs and NPs to prescribe and this increase to 275 is revital in preventing the deaths and illnesses that are happening from opioids now. So here I've just listed a few of the, the um, names, buprenorphine, we've got the Suboxone sublingual film, Subzol, Bunavail, there's probably others coming out, that one goes in the cheek, and generic. Now it says buprenorphine naloxone. Naloxone is an opioid blocker that we use to prevent an overdose from becoming fatal. But that's not what it's doing in the buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is used to get high. 
by. Um, if injected or snipped up the nose, so naloxone has been added to it so that if somebody does choose to try to inject or sniff the buprenorphine, the naloxone will significantly delay the high and makes it a much less less valued product if one is trying to become high. Um, it does. It is occasionally used for that, but primarily if people buy it on the street, it's to treat their own drug addiction because they can't find a doctor. Um, it has no effect if it's put under the tongue. There's also a couple of buprenorphine products that don't have naloxone in it. There's a generic sublingual. We use that in pregnant women. And probuphine has just been, oh, I thought I fixed that. It's actually out of the FDA um, review and is available. So it's a long-acting subdermal implantable product that will help people that are on lower doses on buprenorphine if they don't want to have to take, a pill, um, take the, the preparation on a daily basis. Why can we have it in the community? Well, I have no idea why Congress did it, but I'm glad they did. But we do know that it's really hard to overdose on buprenorphine alone. So methadone is a pure agonist. It completely turns on the opioid receptors. So does heroin. So does so do um, the pain medicines like Percocet, like um, hydromorphone, OxyContin. They turn on those receptors fully. And if you turn regularly, you won't get high. The tolerance prevents that. Naloxone is a pure antagonist. It blocks the opioid receptors. You can take it all day long and you won't get any kind of a buzz from it whatsoever. Buprenorphine's in between. It's called a partial agonist. It's got a ceiling effect by which higher doses don't increase the activity. Taking buprenorphine alone is extremely unlikely to lead to a fatal overdose. Um, in New York City, data find that finds that buprenorphine is associated with almost none of the fatal overdoses out there. And when it's there, it's usually in conjunction with other drugs. Now, if you mix buprenorphine with a large amount of benzodiazepines like Valium or Xanax, especially if you inject it, the risk of overdose does exist. But it, it makes work, honestly. Now, I don't understand why, and everybody understand why, but this this effect doesn't seem to be fully the case for young children. So it does need to be kept out of reach children. It's less deadly than many other things might be in the medicine cabinet, but we, children can over, have fatal overdoses with buprenorphine alone. So this partial agonist leads to some really strange effects. Um, I need my patients come in in a little bit of withdrawal to start buprenorphine. They'll come in withdrawal, I'll give them the buprenorphine, and they will feel better. But if somebody is tendent on their methadone, on heroin, on OxyContin, and they're, feeling nor they're not feeling withdrawal, they're feeling normal or high, and they take buprenorphine, it will put them into withdrawal, whether or not it's got the naloxone in there, and it's extremely unpleasant. Um, so it, there's a little bit of a finesse to getting people started, but it's not hard. Um, finally, the occasional user can get high if they inject it, um, but here in New York City and probably most of New York State, there are many other things available that are opioids that will get them high that are much preferred products. Similar to opioids, constipation, nausea, vomiting. Um, I mentioned that the person who is dependent will go into what we call precipitated withdrawal. It's really unpleasant. They are suddenly, they go from being normal or high to really drug sick. Um, it's pregnancy category C, which means that it's not fully elucidated. It's not said to be safe in pregnancy. It's not said to be unsafe, but we do use both methadone and buprenorphine in pregnant women. Because taking care of mom is important. She's got to be supported and not using illicit drugs. And we also know that even if some babies are born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, they do very well. It's, it's definitely preferred to any illicit drugs and risks, the benefits far outweigh the risks. We'll talk naloxone in a little while. That prevents a fatal overdose, I mean an overdose from becoming fatal. Can methadone prevent overdoses happening in the first place? They, people take it on a daily basis. They're tolerant. It's hard to take enough heroin on top to get high, let alone to have respiratory depression and die. So I, I could show you lots of data on that, but I'm going to show you this from Baltimore. So the red line is overdoses up through 2009. The 
baseline that starts over around 100 is methadone maintenance. That's, that's the number of people on methadone, which rose some and then dropped off a little bit. And then the green line that starts down at zero, you can see in 2001, 2002, when buprenorphine was, was approved, they started getting buprenorphine into the community. As the amount of buprenorphine in the community went up, the number of overdoses, of fatal overdoses in Baltimore went down. Um, they do have an naloxone program, but it, it's only recently become very big in, method, in, in Maryland. So there's a very strong correlation, and I could trade data from, from Norway and France and lots of places. The increased access to methadone and buprenorphine decreases overdose deaths. Um, we know for many years that opioid maintenance reduces the possibility of bloodborne infections and other infections, actually. Um, methadone, in, if you look at all the studies, it basically comes out to methadone maintenance is associated with about a 54% decrease in the risk of HIV among people who inject drugs. In fact, when PEPFAR was doing a lot more work, that was a requirement for some countries in Eastern Europe that to have funding to fight HIV, you will have to include methadone because that's such a powerful tool. Buprenorphine, we have less years of data, but as it reduces the risk behaviors, we expect to see the same results in reduction of infections. And in fact, there's some new exciting studies showing reductions in hepatitis C incidence among people on methadone or buprenorphine. Hepatitis C, as I said, is harder to prevent, but we are seeing that data, in fact, some data from you, San Francisco, which is pretty exciting. With Matt and buprenorphine, we spend an awful lot of time looking at, at um, how it impacts HIV and hepatitis C treatment. Um, we don't look at so many other things. We really focus on those two, but we know it's easier for people to be adherent and to achieve viral suppression when they have HIV if they're an opioid user. Um, we know it reduces emergency room visits among, those, um, among these folks, that's Medicaid data, and clearly higher successes in full, um, fully successful in hepatitis C treatment. And then I'm so happy about this more recent study. This is federally qualified health centers found that people being treated by their primary care doctors on buprenorphine is associated with higher rates of primary care screenings. So we're finally getting beyond the hepatitis C and the HIV data, which is extremely important, into the general data about people taking care of themselves. And it's really intriguing that that's when prescribed in primary care versus in psychiatry. It should be both places, but I'm here to talk about primary care today. What about people that continue to inject? As we have this problem where people think that people shouldn't be getting buprenorphine, doctors think people shouldn't be getting buprenorphine if they continue to use any drugs. Well, this is data from Norway. They do a lot of cool things there, where they looked at people coming to a syringe exchange who are also on methadone or buprenorphine and compared them to those that were not on methadone and buprenorphine or buprenorphine. So these are in people injecting, and they found that they reported fewer non-fatal overdoses. They were less likely to inject frequently. They were much less likely to use heroin on a daily or almost daily basis. They reduced their activities such as theft and drug dealing. So these medications are extremely valuable, even if you don't get to that goal of having them stop using illicit drugs. Um, we have myths among my fellow physicians, I think. Um, you are required, I am required to have access to counseling for my patients if I want, which in New York City can be, this is the telephone number, 1-800-LIFE-NET. I'm not required to provide it on the setting, in, in my own setting, and I'm not required to make my patients go to it. Um, we have a lot of people that don't want counseling, and so they should still be able to access these medications. But if you start speaking with your patients and clients, you may find that those that said, I would have counseling so that, you know, I miss my counseling appointment so they won't prescribe to me anymore. Counseling is great stuff. I think we have nutrition people here. I think counseling in nutrition is vital for people with diabetes, but I'll still give them their insulin if they won't go. We need to kind of look at that with buprenorphine. Counseling is great, but not the key to successfully staying alive. Um, we also have many providers who, and sometimes when I just talk to the physicians and say that's not required, they're like, oh, okay. Again, the early training sort of suggests that we should put people into higher levels of care if they continue to use other drugs. Buprenorphine treats opioid addiction. It doesn't treat alcohol. It doesn't treat stimulants. A lot of times people stop using other things once they've got their primary thing out of the way. 
But again, we need to keep people in treatment, even if they continue to smoke marijuana, use cocaine, inject heroin some of the time. Um, I, I have emphasized that, that long-term treatment is the key. Still many physicians, partly based on the training, believe that short-term is better, and they also think, well, I can only have 30 or 100 patients, I've got to make room for other people. But we know that studies find that people that have actually made the step into treatment are very likely to relapse if they stop treatment. Um, also, and we've got to get rid of this one, for a little while there they said, okay, we're going to look at some brain scans and it looks like 16 milligrams of buprenorphine is sufficient to fill up all the receptors. may look like that on a brain scan. When we look at, at human beings, um, I've got a 2016 study there, we find that many people do do better on the higher doses, 24 milligrams or even 32. And this is a big problem out there for people not succeeding. We've got to keep in mind that the high risk of, of overdose and other mortality and illnesses from relapsed opioids, we keep people in treatment in a way that's acceptable to them. Their use of drugs, psychosocial services may be helpful. Um, I had a very low threshold buprenorphine program for a while as a pilot. I didn't make any of my patients go to counseling. Most of them did. They come and say, wow, this this is wonderful. I don't need drugs anymore. This, this is a miracle. And then two weeks later, they come back and, wow, I'm really bored and I've got all this stuff to deal with. And most people went into some kind of counseling on their own, and it can be helpful. Um, if they continue to use other drugs, you might want to see a doctor, might want to see them more often, especially if they're worried that they might be selling their buprenorphine on the street. And, you know, a higher level of care may be necessary, but there's not a whole lot out there, so we really need to be aware, um, keep that in mind. Long-term inpatient may be fine, but many of the inpatient places we've got now do not allow for people to be on methadone or buprenorphine, and so it may be a lower level of care. That's changing. OASS is working very hard on that. So people do sell their buprenorphine on the street. People sell most anything on the street. Um, but what we find from studies is that most of the, the buprenorphine that's sold on the street is people that won't take it because they don't want to use heroin anymore. They can't find heroin. And for a lot of my patients, when I was doing this very early on, I'd get these phone calls and say, hi, one of your patients, I won't say who, gave me a buprenorphine. This is great. I really want to be in treatment. So sometimes this diversion is the entry. I already said it can be used to get high, but in New York, people are going to use other stuff. Really, it's lack of access that promotes diversion. And we know from some pretty powerful work in, in, in Australia that even if you observe dosing every day, people's drugs are actually pretty smart people if they survive using drugs. So it still gets out there. So the answer to diversion is really increased access. That. I'm going to talk a little bit about the new Office of Drug User Health, which is at the AIDS Institute, and uh, go briefly through some of their initiatives. Then it looks like, well, yeah, with plenty of time for questions. So buprenorphine is central in this. I took these slides from the Department of Health, so I left the date up there. Um, they, I'm a consultant, I can say we are working really hard to recruit new doctors to prescribe it, and now that we've got this thing where nurse practitioners and PAs can do it, they're very much part of this recruitment. So there will be academic detailing, like pharmacy, um, pharmaceutical companies go into medical offices to educate doctors. Well, the department will be sending medical people and others into the offices to talk about buprenorphine. Um, we, there will be waiver trainings, that hour, eight-hour training. The first one sponsored by the state will be a week from Saturday, um, doing a lot of networking with some of the federally called health centers, 21 of which across New York State have gotten federal grants to increase access to buprenorphine, creating mentorship. So when you're having your first couple patients or the first one that, that you don't know what to do, there's somebody you know you can pick up the phone. A uh, provider directory is very challenging to make, but that, that's in progress. And I'll talk about the hubs in a few minutes, but relationships with Action programs and some social media campaigns. So you should be seeing all of this coming up in your neighborhood soon. Um, a few words about syringe access. As you hopefully know, there's 23 syringe exchange programs, that most of which offer many, many other services. I know some are on the phone with us today across New York with many different models of service, whether it's going into the community, having storefronts. 
And we also have the expanded syringe access program where anyone and above, I believe, can go to a pharmacy and buy 10 or fewer syringes and needles without any prescription. Um, and this is really kind of an arbitrary number, but it doesn't seem to be people can go back the same day and get more. It's not a problem. So if you're thinking about messages for talking to people about syringes, this is what I would say when I admitted people to my methadone program oh so long ago. Um, I hope you never inject again, but I want to be sure that you and your friends know where to get a sterile syringe. And I was in East Harlem, most everybody knew, but it just, people did double take and said, you carry me even if I still inject? It was a great icebreaker, even though it wasn't information that they didn't already have. It was information they already had. This is just out, and you can see this. The point is a tool locator so that people can find syringe access and syringe disposal anywhere in New York. So this is something you can download onto your phone or access, and um, it's very, very exciting. This is just out in the past month or two. Um, you're probably a little bit aware of the naloxone, or very much aware, many of you, of the naloxone initiative. As I so the brand name, the old term is Narcan, but that's been rebranded by a particular drug company. So this rapidly reverses opioid-related sedation and respiratory depression if administered intranasally or by injection. Um, it's an extremely unpleasant experience to have, so if somebody is unconscious and slowing down or stopping breathing and this is administered, they will wake up, and if they're dependent, they may be pretty grumpy because they'll have gone immediately into withdrawal. It lasts for about 30 to 90 minutes, which is plenty of time to get to emergency department, but in almost all cases, it's enough time to prevent an overdose from returning and becoming fatal. Everybody in New York, in, there's actually no age limit anymore, may carry and use naloxone at the state. Here's a picture of the formulations. The upper left corner is the intranasal one. That, that is widely distributed by the Department of Health across the state. The upper right-hand corner is an injectable one, which is also distributed by New York State. Lower left corner is an auto-injector. It talks you through the process. It's kind of amusing. Um, and then the lower right corner is the most recently um, approved one. It's an intranasal formulation that is we're still kind of looking at because it's got a much higher dose than the one on the upper left corner. To do, to learn how to do this. So we can do this in a pharmacy, you can do this on a street corner. People just need to know what does naloxone do, how to recognize an overdose, somebody unconscious turning blue, not breathing, breathing weird, how to make sure that they're really out with a sternal rub, call 911 or use naloxone, whichever one comes first and then do the other. We usually try to give some hands-on pr um, practice with the device and the recovery position. I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to skip that slide. 350 programs across New York State doing this in the community. Law enforcement is carrying it in outside of New York City. I just don't have the New York City data. They've done over 2,000 administrations of naloxone. Firefighters in some places are carrying it. We've got on the part of Department of Health and Corrections and Harm Reduction Coalition to eventually train every soon to be released inmate in New York State and offer them a kit as they leave. It's available in schools and it is now in pharmacies. Kind of funny, pharmacies were the last place to get the medication, but it's available under standing orders. So many of you have insurance. You could go to the pharmacy and say, I would like naloxone and you can be supplied it and probably your insurance will cover it. Um, I'm just going to end with drug user health hubs. This is an exciting initiative which will be started in Ithaca, Albany, and Buffalo area, hopefully expanded, but to connect all the providers, to connect the harm reduction program with the emergency room, hopefully with, with law enforcement in some places. Um, so when somebody has an overdose and they go to the emergency room, that they're not just watched until they're stable and released, somebody can come and say, what do you need? Do you need primary care? Do you need naloxone? Do you want to be in drug treatment? To begin to connect the various services, so the OASS programs, harm reduction, all these different services, and it's, it's an exciting, innovative idea that I can't be working on. So 
of these really necessitate a coordinated approach. Coordination of the various inter inter um, interventions, we need to coordinate across agencies, OASAS, Department of Health, pharmacy, all sorts of places, and the collaborations with the community-based organizations. So I think all of you are from agencies that need to be playing big roles in changing what's going on with opioids in New York State and sending an example for other places. I have left plenty of time for questions. I hope that's, if you have questions. Sharon, thank you. Amazing. I'm going to open up the line for questions, but before I do that, because um, we may get some um, crosstalk, uh, there's a couple options. Folks can either um, you know, uh, certainly raise a question um, verbally, or if you want to raise your hand, you can do it by your name and the screen, and we can acknowledge you. You can also use the chat feature, and I'll keep an eye on that. So if there's anyone that doesn't want to speak and wants to write a question out, I will keep an eye on that, and we'll present them to Dr. Stancliffe. So I'm going to open the lines now. What we have. If you're not going to ask a question, you certainly can mute yourself. Okay, it looks like Sue has, would like to ask a question. Uh, hand raise. You're not. You can also disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone out there uh, been working with this population? What have your experiences been? Uh, that there's a lot of information that that's kind of gave. Um, anyone resonating with it or have questions about it? Hey, John. Yes. It's Timmy. Timmy in uh, Albany, the Alliance for Positive Health. How are you? Hey, good. How you doing? Welcome. I'm wonderful. Uh, Dr. Sharon, thank you so very much for that information. I did have a question regarding, um, and I know you, you didn't get, get much into the um, the Vivitrol, but um, are, is the same classification by doctors required for for the, um, the are they required, uh, in order to administer Vivitrol, are doctors required to also complete an eight-hour course uh, to be qualified? Uh, to, to dispense it, or are all doctors authorized to pretty much dispense the Vivitrol? First, uh, all all doctors are authorized to do it, so there there is no training. It is um, not just like a flu shot, so they know you need to uh -huh. inject it, mix it up, and inject it properly, but all can do it. There are other barriers to access. It's a little complicated. You need it's, it's expensive, and you need to have it in your office when the person comes. They can't just go to the pharmacy and pick it up. So. Are some other kinds of barriers to it that need to be overcome. Um, there is no training qualification for it. Um, and, there's, and there's no cap on how many patients a doctor can, training. can monitor. And, and I will say that a lot of it's gotten to be very popular among corrections across the country. So mm -hmm. we are seeing people leave incarcerated settings on Vivitol and they will need a place to follow follow up a month and I, I do have some concern that there are barriers to having it in primary care and I hope that, that those people that want to continue it can find a site where they can continue it. Um, it does have high retention. It's not, a lot of people don't want to continue it. They've spent a month where they might have felt like they wanted to get high and they and they couldn't. So. Um, retention difficulties. I also should point out that for some people it's extremely good for treatment for alcohol misuse. It's got we've got data on that. Right. So it definitely has a use, but it's we need to see how how it about before we push it very hard, I think. I have one other question, Sharon, and I'm sorry to be a pain, but uh, with the naltrapone, um and uh, or the buprenorphine, isn't there also a, a risk of if let's say a person <clears throat> is prescribed to take let's say four milligrams, and if they were to double it, it may it may in fact produce some sort of sense of euphoria, um, and like a, uh, something a little closer to the 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 state that's uh, that's that's established when uh, they're under the influence of heroin. And then make a long long question short is, can they kind of die, or is there a possibility of them getting high if they were to double the dose of the uh, the sublinguals? Um, well, doubling the dose sublingually might lead to some more sedation, and some people really mm -hmm. like to be sedated. Um, it's okay. not going to cause a euphoric rush, but okay. 
Okay. Yes. I mean, people can definitely, and and people that use drugs know they're they're chemists. <laughs> um, they know how to do stuff. But yes, naltrexone is very appealing to some people because no, you can't get high from it at all. Um, right. We also want people to be on a medicine that makes them feel okay, and only for some people does naltrexone reduce the craving as well as as um, block the opiate, so that that can be a very uncomfortable state for somebody to really want to get either high or normal. I mean, most of the time when people are taking heroin or any other drug, the times that they get high are few and far between because their tolerance is so high. They're just trying to get normal. So we can have people on naltrexone that really want to feel normal and they don't have access to that at the moment. Other, some people really like it. Um, I haven't Last talked to many. Last question, Sharon. And Please, the, go ahead. The, I also work in a, a, a drug rehabilitation center where we they, they are, in fact, administering uh, the, uh, the Suboxone, uh, mm -hmm. the Sublinguals, even um, the, the Subzol as well. What, what I've noticed just by observation is just like like clients who are, are well, there's, there's the, the, the behavior that, that maybe is related or connected to the drug, which is like uh, trying to, they're supposed to take it, but they slip, slip it or try to hide it and then use it or sell it to someone later or someone else in the program. Also, while online waiting to get their medication, the inability that comes about when uh, they, they don't have access to it, and it almost mirrors the behavior of someone waiting to get their fix, you know what I mean? Uh, and that's what made me. Mm -hmm. That's what sparked the question about whether or not does it really is it kind of is it producing some sort of euphoric effect? Because some of the behavior doesn't actually absolutely curve or change. And I'm glad you 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 mentioned the piece about the 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 need for um, you know you know uh, like maybe mental health services or, or, or counseling and, and things like that to to address those the other issues. Well, I I guess one thing I didn't say is that both methadone and buprenorphine cause dependence and and. Mm -hmm. Addiction is different than dependence. Um, people actually, a lot of the antidepressants we look at cause dependence. People will go into withdrawal if they stop taking them abruptly, and it can be kind of significant. Um, yeah. So if people aren't getting, especially their methadone dose, after about 24 hours, shorter time for some people, they, mm -hmm. they will be going into withdrawal, so they will be irritable, just like they feel irritable when they're not getting their heroin or whatever. Buprenorphine mm -hmm. is a little more variable. I've had some patients that just say, I don't want to be on it anymore, and they walk away. They may relapse and come back, but they didn't mm -hmm. feel much in the way of withdrawal. I have other patients that want to taper off, and even little bits cause some difficulty. So, yes, when people are waiting, you know, when it's been a certain amount of time since their last dose, they will feel some withdrawal. Ideally, mm -hmm. we give them the medicine before they feel that, so they, instead of sort of leading an up and down life of the heroin user, it's pretty flat. Now, with methadone, some people tell me that they, one of the reasons some people I know like methadone is they say, I sort of like that that little bit of withdrawal, then having a sense of relief. I don't get mm -hmm. it with buprenorphine. It's it's just really steady. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, yeah, settings where people are are getting doses of buprenorphine. Yes. Mm -hmm, okay. Yes. There, there's not many of those, um, and I think they they do have a role for. We too much diverted on the street. Um, mm -hmm. But again, keep in mind when we think about buprenorphine diversion, what would you rather have your relapsing client get, get on his or her hands? Fentanyl in their heroin or right. somebody else's buprenorphine? Yeah. I want it Absolutely. to be my buprenorphine, but it's so much safer. That's, that's what we want people to buy. I, I, I totally agree with you, Doctor. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks I've for the questions. A, a, a written question that I want to just read if you could uh, respond to, uh, I think it's a quick one. Was the point an actual app that helps locate local syringe exchange programs? Syringe exchange programs and pharmacies and places for disposing of needles. Okay. So I think if you go to the health department site under drug user health, you can find the link. I, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Maybe I could do that and go back to that slide. We could probably send that out, folks. Um, there you go. Yes, this is totally new, so I haven't even tried it yet, but I'm excited about it. <laughs> okay. Um, and Michael Guilford has a question. Please raise hand. Uh, yes, actually, I have two questions. Mike 
Guilford at Evergreen Health Services out here in Buffalo. Yay. Uh, the first one is probably relatively short. Did I hear you mention that drugs such as cocaine may have fentanyl mixed in? Yes. Okay, so the is cocaine, is it by snorting? If a person smoked the cocaine, would that destroy the fentanyl? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I'll just have to find out. <laughs> Okay, um, but I was curious if that was what I actually heard. Yeah. The second part is we had talked a little bit about the um, stigmas that go along with the uh, drug treatment, particularly with the methadone, mm -hmm. and I was wondering uh, if you could expand a little bit if there's any particular difference in the type of resistance that we might see with people who are who are your opioid users as opposed to those who may be using meth or using, you know, crack or or other drugs, if there's any particular difference in the stigma and the resistance. Um, well, certainly, just, if I don't understand the question properly, I mean, certainly we don't have any great treatment like we do for opioids for methamphetamine or for cocaine. Um, stigma is really interesting. I mean, I see users that are like, they don't want to be around those crackheads, they're all crazy. <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, sort of intra-drug user stigma right. about different things that people, you know, the K2 users, they don't want to have anything to do with them. Um, so, but we, again, we don't have any, we have good social treatment, but psychosocial treatment doesn't work for everybody for any drug, whereas for opioids, if some, most people, if they decide they want to change their relationship to opioids, will get some help, maybe not full success, but will get some help from either methadone or buprenorphine. Um, now, if it's methadone, they have to go there every single day to get the help, and, and um, depending on the community you're in, that you can just be seen there. Um, yeah, we, with my old methadone program in, in Ireland, we had people come from far Rockaway. They didn't want to be seen in their, their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, buprenorphine, of course, allows much more private dosing if you're getting it through primary care. Even if you have to go in once a week to primary care, it, it just looks very, very different. For the, you know, the stimulants, usually the treatment that is in a drug treatment program, which can feel stigmatizing, but, and I, you know, people do sometimes feel stigmatized going to harm reduction centers too, but harm reduction centers do offer, depending on the need in their locality, um, support groups for people wanting to change their relationship with drugs. And in fact, sometimes an interesting thing happens, they recruit peers to do a variety of things, including carry syringes and do education, and they recruit peers, people that are using drugs, so they can go into their drug using circles, it's interesting, a lot of people stop using drugs when they go through the training and education. Other things become more important to them. Um, so that's an interesting impact, whether you're an opioid user or a stimulant user. Did I address your question okay? Yes, basically you're saying that there's stigma in any and all of the drug use, even if it's a maintenance drug, there's still yeah. a stigma that's attached to it. and it's pretty much all across. So yes, you answered both of my questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute myself now. Yes. Any questions? Well, time again, Dr. Kenneth, thank you so much for uh, being with us today and presenting so much information. This was recorded, so it will be available to the BHE providers on the um, PTAC uh, website, but it can also be available to other initiatives, um, and we'll be sending that information out if anyone wants other staff to uh, listen in. Uh, we'll have the recording available. So thank you again, Dr. St. Cliff, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Okay, Thanks, thank John. you. Thank you, Dr. Okay.